Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-kareem. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, as we greet you from my sitting room here in the Caribbean island of Trinidad on this the 25th day of the month of Safar in the year 1445 with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. And our topic is entitled Beyond Muhammad Ali Jinnah, The Destiny of Pakistan. And we pray for Allah's guidance as we take up this difficult subject to bring clarity to a subject which is very seldom understood from an Islamic theoretical perspective. I have found so many who make a lot of negative comments about Muhammad Ali Jinnah, nasty comments about Muhammad Ali Jinnah, declaring him to be a traitor, declaring him to be a client of the British and all of this nonsense. These are Muslim people who have not understood the subject. And I want to begin today to bring some clarity to the subject. This cannot be the only video that I can offer on the subject, but this is the beginning. I want you to understand that Muhammad Ali Jinnah led the Muslims of India. He was the undisputed leader of the Muslims of India. They chose him as their leader. The Indian National Congress, led by Mohandas Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, they had this sang this song all through from the beginning to the end. They said, we are the only party which represents the whole of India. We are not a communal party, communal party. We represent all of India. They sang this song all through. They danced this dance all through. They were happy with this. The Muslims said, no. They said, totally false. The Muslims said, you do not represent us. It is this man who represents us, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, not you, Gandhi. If the Congress was correct, that they represented all of India, then how come Pakistan was born? Don't you have any sense in your head? It is the Muslim view which is correct. And your view was false and wrong, and you were misguided from day one, and you paid the price for it. That the Indian National Congress did not represent the Muslims. No. The Muslims were represented by the All India Muslim League, and they appointed Muhammad Ali Jinnah as their leader. They had such great respect and love for him and loyalty to him that they gave him a title the same way the Hindus gave to Gandhi the title Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi used to say, I don't like that title, <laughs> but they called him Mahatma, the great soul. In the same way the Muslims called him Muhammad Ali Jinnah, they called him Al-Qaid Al-Azam. Al-Qaid, this is Arabic, not Urdu. Al-Qaid Al-Azam. Qaid Al-Azam. Or the greatest leader. Al-Azam, or the great leader. And uh, even Gandhi used to refer to him as Qaid Al-Azam. Hmm? Why did Muslims of India, why did they confer this great honor of the, on this man? Why? And you are casting stones at him and you are saying nasty things about him and yet a hundred million, a seventy million, eighty million Muslims of India, they thought differently and they chose to, to choose him as they didn't choose a Maulana. 
They didn't choose a sheikh. They didn't choose an Islamic scholar. No. There were so many all over India, but they did not choose one of them. Outstanding scholars of Islam in India, but none of them were chosen to lead the Muslims. Why did they choose Muhammad Ali Jinnah? This is what we have to answer in order to address the subject beyond Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the destiny of Pakistan. The answer lies, the answer lies in the fact that Britain was in control of, Britain, of India at that time. And Britain was the, the ruling state in the world. The transfer of power was now taking place between Britain to the United States. This transfer of power will be continuing until 1956 when it became plain and clear to the whole world that Britain is no longer the ruling state. This was the United States has now taken over as the ruling state in the world. This was made plain and clear in 1956 and swears. I don't have the time to remind you of that. So in 1940, 41, 42, 43, up to 47, Britain is still the ruling state in the world. And uh, the Muslims in India and the Hindus in India do not have the military capacity to wage war on Britain to gain their freedom. So they both chose, both the Hindus and the, the Hindus and the Muslims, they chose to wage a constitutional struggle to win freedom. Except that Gandhi said, we also must choose a, a, a policy of peaceful resistance. Um, I can't remember the Sanskrit word for it. Non-violent resistance. Gandhi was the apostle of non-violent resistance. But it is strange that the same apostle of non-violent resistance who, uh, who rejected war and opposed war, yet in the First World War, in the First World War, Gandhi was walking from village to village with a soldier with him with a drum. And he was appealing to people to enlist in the British Army, British Indian Army. There is a, there is a manifest conflict of interest here, uh, uh, a contradiction in the man. This is a contradiction. There. On one hand, you are preaching non-violence, and on the other hand, you're walking, recruiting people to fight in the British Army. What's wrong with you, Gandhi? And so now, the Muslims had to recognize that Britain is in charge. And if you choose to struggle with a constitutional struggle, you don't need a Maulana to lead you. <laughs> no, no. You, need, you don't need a businessman to lead you in that struggle. You need someone with a knowledge of law, someone with a knowledge of constitutional law, and someone most of all with a knowledge of British law. This was Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Not only that, Muhammad Ali dressed like an Englishman. He spoke like an Englishman. His diet was that of an Englishman. The drinks that he drank was that of an Englishman. His culture was that of English. Everything about the man was English. And that was why he was able to succeed. That's right. If Muhammad Ali Jinnah had a beard, and if he was going to the masjid five times a day to perform salat, and if he was publicly identified with his Islamic credentials and he was a scholar of Islam, Pakistan would never have been born. That's right. You have to understand history. What Allah does, that they plan their plans and he plans his plans. And so it was precisely because Muhammad Ali Jinnah studied law in Britain 
precisely because he was always faithful. He had legal integrity. He was a brilliant lawyer because he knew constitutional law. He knew the British mind. And because he waged a brilliant, brilliant legal struggle that eventually Britain had to acquiesce. It was when Britain accepted that yes, Pakistan will have to be created. Then the Indian National Congress also accepted that Pakistan has to be created. The Hindu people never accepted what their leaders accepted. And so when the Indian National Congress agreed to the partition of India and the birth of Pakistan, the Hindu people who supported the Indian National Congress responded with a carnage of blood, blood flowing on the streets of Delhi, people running like rabbits and like dogs to save their lives on the streets of Delhi. Yes, hundreds of thousands of Muslims in refugee camps in Delhi, in Delhi, from the time you leave your home to seek refuge somewhere, you've lost your home. You can't go back to your home because it's now occupied by others who are coming from, from the areas which is now going to be Pakistan. You've lost your home. And so Pakistan came into being because of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. No other leader could have succeeded, none. No Islamic scholar could have succeeded, none. No Maulana, no Mufti, none. No politician could have done it. No businessman could have done it. Only a man who dressed like the British, who spoke like the British, who was educated in Britain, who had an acute legal ed education, who knew constitutional law, who, whose diet was British, whose drinks of the tank was British, whose entire life was British, but he had his heart with integrity. And one, once, once he realized that this was going to be Hindu oppression over Muslims, if the British withdraw from India and leave power with the Indian National Congress, they will oppress the Muslims. He left the Indian National Congress. Before this, he was the ambassador of Hindu-Muslim unity in Britain, in, in India. That's right. But this was a man who would not tolerate oppression. This was a man who would not tolerate oppression. So he would not tolerate a post-British India in which a Hindu majority will oppress a Muslim minority. That's what's happening today. Look at Modi's India. Look at Modi's India today. Look at what they've just done to Kashmir. <laughs> if there was no Pakistan, what would Modi have done to the Muslims? Huh? So because Muhammad Ali Jinnah could recognize the danger of oppression, and he could see through the Indian National Congress that what they wanted was freedom from British rule, and then an opportunity for a majority to take control of the country and then they can oppress the minority. That's why he waged the struggle that he waged. Why would Britain allow an Islamic state to come into being? Britain did not accept the creation of Pakistan because Britain feared, because Britain feared Pakistan would become an Islamic state. No, no, no. Britain was confident that Muhammad Ali Jinnah would not bring into being a model of a state which is like the Khilafah state, which is what the Khilafah movement wanted. Because they knew the man, they knew his personality, they knew his thinking. They were confident <laughs> that when Pakistan was born, it would be in the model of the Republic of Turkey. That is why Britain agreed to Pakistan being born. Had the Muslims of India been led by anyone else 
who had given even an inkling that what we want is an Islamic state in Pakistan, Britain would never have consented to Pakistan being born. And so Muhammad Ali Jinnah must be complimented, respected and honored for the role that he played to give freedom to the people who live today in Pakistan. That's all that he did. He never attempted to do more than that. No, that was not his calling. His calling was to win the battle for freedom. And he fought the battle bravely and brilliantly. And credit must be given to him for his success in his struggle. But having done that, this is now only stage one of the struggle. The Muslims had to choose him at that time for that struggle for freedom. But now, after 75 years, it is not a constitutional lawyer. It is not someone who is dressed in the British way, who eat the British menu, who drink the British drinks, who speak the language of Britain, whose culture, that is not the leader that you want now. That is what leader you needed. That is the leader that you needed at that time when Britain was leaving India. That's not the leader now. The destiny of, of Pakistan is connected with the destiny of Afghanistan. The destiny of Pakistan is connected with the destiny of the Muslims of India and Kashmir. The destiny of Pakistan is connected with the destiny of the Muslims of Bangladesh. Pakistan does not exist in a vacuum. This is political myopia. Rather, Pakistan is part of a sea of Islam in South Asia. And the future is a future, a destiny, in which the Muslims of this region will now have to separate themselves. This is what you have to do. Who are those Muslims who want to remain faithful to the Quran and to absolute truth in the Quran? They will be a people who remain faithful to the Hadith to the extent that the, to the, extent that the Hadith is in harmony with the Quran. These people must now come together. And the others who are not prepared to be faithful to the Quran and absolute truth in the Quran must be separated. You don't have to have a relationship of hostility with each other, but you have to separate from each other. And the two groups can negotiate with each other, but this group has to be established. In Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh. Those Muslims who say, we wish to remain faithful to absolute truth in the Quran, and to the Hadith to the extent that it is in harmony with the Quran, come together, come together as a community. You don't have to be a politically organized community at this time, but you have to be an ideologically organized community at this time. And when you come together as a community and you build bonds with each other which transcend political boundaries, you are moving now in the direction of a destiny which lies beyond the present state of Pakistan. This is all I need to say at this time, to defend Muhammad Ali Jinnah, to honor Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and to pray for Allah's blessings on his soul because he accomplished a political miracle. And we have to give credit to him for the struggle that he waged with enormous brilliance and enormous integrity and utmost sacrifice. The man gave his life so you can be free. So pray for Allah's blessing on him. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.